There were some accidents. <laughs> you do. <too. laughs> I set myself on fire with a Holy crap. <laughs> it is unbelievable. And you know, you peel the glove off and it goes out. Oh, I, I had a... Uh, My whole hand was engulfed in fire. I, I cleaned the, uh, the glove box with uh, rubbing alcohol and then I had a, a little torch. Uh, uh, you know, butane torch that I used for flame sterilizing. I did that inside and it, it lit it. I had a lighter in one hand and the torch in the other hand and when the box blew, it blew the lid off and blue flame came shooting out of the holes onto me. I pulled the lighter and the thing out through them and I caught myself and the box was still burning and I, I pulled the lid up and it flashed again. And I'm lucky. I, I should have nubs. <laughs> I should have hooks, nubs, everything. I just, that, my whole body. It was unbelievable. But anyway, once I cultured that first mushroom and I started to chase what I learned. I failed forward. That's very important to never give up. Even when you're on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Stop, drop, and roll. <laughs> I have a fire extinguisher here. Uh, so what I'm going to talk a little bit about today is uh, just tissue cultures, uh, how to isolate I'm going to also show you some of my little tricks that I use in the lab. I'm also going to end it with, because uh, there really isn't that much content with, uh, with lab skill, um, I'm also going to talk about morel cultivation, if you want. Yeah. Yes, please. There shouldn't be <coughs> in the room. Um, and this is stuff that's right from the book. So, uh, is morel cultivation important? Yes. It's one of the bigger chapters. Um, so, when we do find a mushroom, and we did the shrimping off the grid session last month, you know, uh, different ways of uh, preserving and expanding mushrooms without a lab, but the lab really gives you a good, a good way to really get to know a mushroom. You really, really do, because it's, when you're dealing with pure culture, um, you can watch it react, you can watch its rate of growth, um, you, can, you can really fine tune what it likes to eat in the lab, and all this. So you really. Um, all these mushrooms that you find, you see out on the tables, every single one is different. They're like a person you know. You know they all like to eat different things. They all like to wear different clothes. Right. So, mushrooms are produce spores. All right, so they germinate. Most of them in nature need to to find each other, mate, and then land and then on a suitable substrate. So they're you know. An unthinkable amount of spores in the air landing, and they're competing for different environments. But what we can do is, if we take a spore print, uh, or we can open this mushroom up top to bottom, and we can clone from that particular mushroom. Okay. So, just like these mushrooms on the interior, uh, we could take a spore print, but on the interior is tissue that can be cloned on the inside. You can make a genetic, an exact genetic copy of this mycelium um, that's even below ground or in the wood. So if you want to go spores, you're getting genetic variability. Right? You get new strains. You get one that may be similar to the parent, but chances are it's not genetically identical. It's going to be a different strain. So all the two spores have to make, um, they have to, uh, then they'll develop viable mycelium. This is the viable mycelium state. That's the preferred state of a fungus, is colonization. It is um, nutrient capture. That's what they're doing. They're colonizing their environment. They're feeding on it. And then when they run out of food, they hit a barrier, then they will fruit. All right? So for lab, we really don't, do we really want mushrooms to fruit in the lab? <laughs> Why not? Because they're, they produce contaminants all by themselves. You want to minimize uh, the presence of spores in the lab. So when you do find a, a, a mushroom, you take a spore print, um, just be very careful. The spores are adhesive. They stick to the, the, the plate or the aluminum that you bring them in on. Chances are they're not going to be airborne. But walking in like this into a clean room is not a good idea. It's producing spores all over the place. So what I like to do is take the print and walk the print in, or clean up and just take some, a little bit of the tissue with me in there. Don't take a sporulating mushroom anywhere near uh, a lab. You can culture it just from a piece of flesh. Yeah, just like this. I'll is show you in a second. Is it similar or the same as a surprise mushroom? Uh, yeah, you can do that. 
Yeah. We, we covered rhizomorphs in the, the last class, wrapping them in cardboard. Um, it's all mycelium. So how do you take a spore from, uh, this is Kingster Ferry, I laid it down on uh, very fine paper, or I use aluminum foil, because it comes up really easy, and you can scrape the spores off of this. So you can store these spores uh, for a couple years. Uh, after about a year, the, the uh, viability goes down 50%. So after two years, you're down to 25%. So after two to three years, pretty, you have to save more spores from one of the mushrooms that you've fruited, right? Where's the best place to store spores? Is it the freezer, the fridge, dry warm? Fridge, yeah, fridge. fridge. You let the spore print dry out, see the moisture, and then fold it, and then put it in a little Ziploc bag or container, seal it, and then put it in the refrigerator. Label. It'll store for a lot longer in the fridge. Um, I've also stored spores inside of water. So I uh, know you've probably all seen um, syringes for sale online. Many of them are from the psilocybin generic, but uh, they also uh, have edibles and medicinal mushrooms. But you can make your own that way. If you uh, take uh, distilled or sterilized water and flood this, and then uh, suck it back up into the syringe. You can also harvest spores too uh, by touching and raking the gills. I do this a lot at forays. It gives me an instant spore print color. Um, and uh, this is an easy way to streak the spores right on these sterilized Q-tips. So I sterilize the Q-tips uh, in a jar, and then I transfer them. I just pull up one sterile out, swap the gill, and then I can streak right from that, right onto the plate. Do you uh, for the darker, for the darker spores, for sure, but not, not if it's a white amanita, <laughs> right? So this is what spores look like under the microscope. Um, they're all different shapes. Obviously, if you're taking a spore print from a mushroom that you ID, um, that someone has identified that you know what that is, you're not going to need to identify it. Um, but just so you can see the shapes, some are smooth, um, and each one of these being close to each other when you streak them on. Uh, an auger plate, there's a very high probability that he's going to germinate and find a mate. They don't have to go very far. Right? So, um, when I pull this mushroom apart and I cut it in half, that's what basically we're seeing in this depiction is a bundle of mycelium. All a mushroom is is a compressed chunk of mycelium. It's dense. It's the same thing that's in the, the, the the, the vegetative state that's in the ground, the logs, that's what it grew from. All right? it, just, it just forms a huge knot, and then it developed the shape all right? that's predetermined by its genetics. That's what gives them all their unique color um, and um, the shapes. So inside this is where we're going to take a little bit of the tissue to clone it, if we wanted to clone that. All right. Now, um, laminar, how many of you own a laminar photo? How many of you want to build them? All right. Did you, everyone who has one, did you buy it or build it? I bought it. You bought it. Okay. Build mine. Second hand. Second hand build? No. I had someone build mine. An orchid grower built mine for me. Uh, actually surprised me one day. Uh, not too long after my hand, you know, was on fire. Um, he said, man, you really need a laminar fluid. And so he, uh, I bought the filter, the HEPA filter, a two by three, two by three filter, and he built the cage and put the fan on and everything and wired it for me. So once that, uh, um, for a two by three filter, be prepared to pay about $300, right? Is that fair? Is anybody else buying filters these days? That's about right. Uh, Uh, my new ones for my lab, I have um, one, two, three, I have five laminars in my new lab. Each filter was $800 for those laminars. Um, but they go a long ways. All you need is a housing and a free filter on top, and it's a blower, and it just blows clean air into a little workstation. You can build these. They're very easy to build. There is a schematic in, in this book on how to build them. Um, so I think if you, if you know what you're doing, you're kind of lower. Flexiglass is nice, it's expensive, um, but you don't, even a wooden housing and a, and a blower, you can probably build one for under 350 bucks. Doesn't have to be a two by three hood either. 
one we had yesterday was smaller. It could have been like a little two by two, uh, something just where you can put your hands in, and culture. It's just pure air that's blowing out towards you. Or you can build one of these. Mine was made out of cardboard, right? Lysol or alcohol inside a flammable box. Not good. Um, you can build some of these. Uh, some, um, I know uh, Jay and Peter, I know that they sometimes have these units. They're actually a big, large, rubber-made, you know, see-through container. And they just cut their, uh, their, uh, their hand holes in there and put the gloves, they glue the gloves on there with rings. And you can put your hands right inside the little box, right? And then you can handle things. Put everything in there, um, wipe it down really clean, and then put your spore print. Then you can transfer, do your transfers right inside one of these little boxes. So this is really cheap to do, build, right? Use one of those rubber paint men, right? All you're doing is trying to minimize the amount of uh, airflow here. Um, sterilizing all of your tools is extremely important. It doesn't matter if you're doing it in a glove box or in front of the laminar. You've got to do this. Um, every, everything that touches a score or an auger plate, um, if you don't sterilize it with a flame, I use... Um, you can use a little alcohol lamp. You can put some ethanol in it. Um, you can use uh, mineral spirits. Or um, this is a little bacteria incinerator. They're a little bit expensive. <laughs> they look retro. And these things are like $280. Right? So you can find one used on eBay, put a new element. The element is, is over $150 if it busts. Oh, back, back to incinerator. But it don't explode your element. But they, they're not highly flammable. But um, I do use alcohol on my hood. It's still equally flammable if you get alcohol near it. Okay? And it flares up. Um, I also dip my tools in ethanol and then I then I put it in here. So there's a little bit of a, a, a flare up first. I try to get everything clean. Why do you use ethanol as opposed to like isopropyl? Um, I don't know. I, I, I can get my ethanol fairly inexpensively. Uh, I also use 70% ethanol, uh, excuse me, isopropyl. Right. Is 70 better? I see I get I get 99 from a, a buddy of mine works for a printing company and he, he bring, he'll bring me 99% isopropyl. You should dilute it. Dilute it to 70. Yeah, the d disinfection works by contact time. 90, 91, 99% evaporates as soon as you spray it. 70% gives that, it's wet and it that stays wet part. longer. So if you are disinfecting, use 70 percent. So a little water and alcohol, the extra water helps to get absorbed into the cell wall, and so it'll kill things actually better and quicker than if you use a pure form of alcohol. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of reasons for it. Um, so yeah, use the same, and it's cheaper. You can dilute it down and save. Well, it's, it's free, so it's even free. It's cheaper than that. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's more free. Right. All right. So, uh, so when you're doing a transfer from a, a mushroom, if you want to clone, right, um, that's just that's all the uh, that's all the amount of tissue you, you would actually need. That's actually too much. All right. When you crack open the interior of a mushroom, and you can grab a mushroom right off the ID table, ask them if you can have one. There's plenty of them, and say, hey, I want to clone one of those oyster mushrooms down at the palm. Walk it down there. You're going to crack it open, and they're going to help you over there. And a low and then with the sterile tool, you're going to take a tiny, tiny piece. You know, that's it. Even smaller than that. And anybody who's grown mushrooms knows that this tiny piece out of that mushroom that's sitting right on my finger, if you transfer that to a pastry plate, if it's an oyster mushroom, and you, if you transfer that every week for 11 weeks, you'll have a million pounds of mushrooms in 11 weeks. That one little chunk, right there. That's that's magnification. So you don't need much. So I crack open the mushroom and keep it sterile, or take a chunk, take a chunk like that, clean into the lab. See, that's really all the all the piece you need. Um, with a hot tool, I'll sterilize it. This is the auger gel. I just push. I make a little hole with the tool. Then I transfer the piece right into that little hole in the gel, and it gives it a light. Nice a lot of nice surface area contact with the gel, right? So it doesn't dry out. Um, you could also, I've also cut and left a piece of auger on top of the piece and made a little sandwich. 
and that helps screening. Right. Uh, this is difficult to clone mushrooms, all right? Um, when you find a mushroom, have, have y'all had any difficulty cloning yeah. some species, varieties, what types? Uh, first it was cubitus, and then now oysters. Oysters? Wow. Oysters are Lion's mane, that's a good example. Or some of the really juicy ones, you know, um, very difficult. Um, this is a uh, Ganoderma. Um, they, they're, some of these mushrooms are very hard to get spore prints out of. Very difficult. If you collect them and they're young, they're not sporulating. You go into the tubes, they haven't formed their spores yet. So I go for the stem attachment all the time now. And it works really, really good. So um, the base of some of these harder mushrooms, like Ganoderma, um, you see that's where it was attached to the wood. It actually has some of the wood still on it. And look how, look how fluffy that mycelium is sitting in there. If you try to take a tissue sample from this reishi mushroom, it's juicy, and it won't clone at all. It'll, go to, it'll contaminate. But if you go to the base of this mushroom, take a tiny, tiny little piece, and transfer it to auger, it works. I mean, I, I hate to say 100% of the time, but it works almost all the time. So, using that better. Can you crack that so far? Uh, you can, yeah. yeah. When you crack open that wood that it's attached to, it's generally very, very clean. Um, he's asking you peroxide so good. I, I do take some of these chunks on occasion and put them in a little Ziploc bag or a uh, test tube and just drop them into 3% uh, hydrogen peroxide and put it in the refrigerator overnight and then take it out, drain the peroxide and put it on the plate. Three. I put it right at three and it has to be refrigerated. This is cold. Do you have a question? I was just going to say another way we've done it with some of the conks is you can cut up the fresh conk in, the, in the small squares and if you put those in a bag and put them in the fridge, sometimes in a couple days maybe that they'll actually try and recover and re it, and then you can pull the little pieces out and drop them right out of the even, even doing the cardboard trick where you take them and stick them on white cardboard, they'll assimilate. Now, I know this is in the book, but I don't have an image on this, on this program. Uh, anybody know what a reishi mushroom is? Or Ganoderma reishi? Do you know their outer edge as they grow are white or yellow? white or yellow, that's advancing mycelium. You also ever notice in nature that sometimes when they, they'll they hit something and engulf it, which is a natural phenomenon, and they'll just keep growing. So what I've been doing is teaching people how to clone uh, polypores with toothpicks and or little pieces of cardboard. And so in my greenhouse last year, um, I begged my publisher to hold on to the book because I wanted it in there so bad. I said, please, and there are no more pictures. I was like, you got to have this one uh, because it's cool. Um, a wet toothpick or little tiny pieces of wet cardboard sitting right on the edge of that polypore. And I just left it there for a few days, and it just completely engulfed it and myceliated the tiny bit of cardboard. And then I took that and I transferred it to a, a plate, and it jumped off like that. Wow. Just a little little trick. But the attachment points are good. Easy to clone from. Uh, pouring auger. Alright. Are they pouring auger at the pond? Has anybody done any culturing yet over there? They're really good. Yeah. They're well, uh, they're definitely mixing in. Okay. So you really need a laminar for this. It's really hard to do it in a glove box. Uh, but um, all auger is is gel, <coughs> uh, nutrified gel basically uh, from a seaweed derivative called auger. Um, you can buy auger, you can buy pre-mixed auger, like malt extract auger, um, potato dextra, you can buy already pre-mixed and all you have to do is measure it out into to water in a jar or a flask, pressure cook it, um, and then put it in front of your laminar where it's sterile. Right? Even a very small little pressure cooker, when I started out at my friend's house, and uh, we were using his mom's little pressure cooker. She had no idea what we were using it for. And, uh, you know, once we started pressure cooking and, and doing it in sterile culture, I mean, the rate of success was huge, you know. This particular flask has about 500 milliliters in it. And 
as it cools down, uh, it's going to gel somewhere around 95 to 98 Fahrenheit. That's pretty much average. Um, so you want to watch it. The easiest way, um, and for years I used to touch it, <laughs> and it's really hot. Everybody used to touch it. Do you touch the jar? Yeah. 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 Sometimes it's hotter than hell. So I just got one of these really, these are like 20 or 30 dollars now, they're little infrared thermometers. Um, and I got them from my lab because it's a safety issue. Um, so I just beam it on there, I watch it come down to 108. Um, and I'm going to tell you why I've got, I, I track the temperature in a minute. Because there's one little advanced technique I want to show you that I think is really, really cool. Um, so this, this would be the moment that you would pour it when it's cool enough to touch the, uh, flask of the jar, and you would pour your pastry plates, right? Everything that you're pouring into needs to be sterile. If you have, don't have pastry plates, you can use uh, baby food jars, you can use anything like that. Right? They're reusable, but if you are using baby food jars, you need to pressure cook those too and put them in. Everything has to be sterile. Most people use plastic, sterilized pastry plates. They're actually really cheap. They're like $8 for a whole sleeve. You know, I buy them by the case, and it goes down to like three or four dollars a sleep, right? By the case, so they're pre-poured. Once you pour them, after it gets close to about 108, 105, you better be pouring. And I do this a lot. I get really busy, and it cools down and it gels up. I know that you've gelled before, <laughs> right? Oh, what do you mean? Gel in the, in the jar flask. Everybody has that condensation. I've had a lot of conversations on like, Yeah. Is that pouring too warm? Or? It's going to be pouring too warm. Um, and you can also crack the lids in front of your laminar when you pour it. Uh, they do that at the university. I started doing that. I mean, you are running a risk of more things getting into your plates. But if you have a really clean filter in a clean room, you shouldn't have any contamination there. Um, sometimes stacking the plates helps, too. It forces the moisture right into the auger. I've noticed that the ones on top of my stacks are, have moisture, and the ones all in the middle are all beautiful and clear. Yeah, you should try to minimize the amount of moisture. Uh, so as the gel cools, that's when you pour your plates. <coughs> all you do is make a stack, you pour a little bit of gel in each plate, and then they solidify very quickly. All right, and then they'll turn into a gel. These are sterile, I can't open them up. Something else you should probably check um, on the water and the media that's really important is the pH. A lot of mushrooms are different. Um, most of them like a pH of, um, I would say, 5, 8 to 7 is pretty accurate. Test the pH of the soil or the growing substrate of the mushroom that you picked. Doesn't that make sense? Holy cow. Don't you want to duplicate its environment? exactly the way it was? Don't you want it to make it feel like at home? And this is cheap stuff here. Uh, the, the, the tape is really cheap and easy. Once you pour your plates, um, I used to label them all. Now I don't, uh, somebody taught me this technique is just to use markers and just have a code or key. So I know exactly what my formulas are and I know exactly what's in them. Just stack them. I have a huge pile of colored Sharpies. And all you do is stack them and just drag drag the color up the whole lid. Right? And you can mark them. Now I can go any plate in my refrigerator or that's sitting in the incubator, I can look right at it and know that it's potato dextrose auger that had um, you know penicillin, you know, and, and another additive in it. Okay? Quickly. <coughs> Use these again, don't know. Uh, you can use glass, they have glass slides. I have glass too. I, I use little, uh, little a ounce uh, curve jars, uh, half pint jars, for squatter, bigger rounds. I know which ones you're talking about, yeah. I use, even, uh, even little uh, tiny flat mason jars, like candle jars, right? Yeah. You drill a hole and, and stuff some polyester in there, you, you can make a nice little jar. What about using alcohol? <coughs> you can do that too. You can surface sterilize them for sure. I mean, just to wipe them clean with alcohol. 
Yeah, you do that. Once your spores or your clone, <coughs> once the spores germinate, if you were to do a spore streak, you could take spores and just streak them across the outer surface. Some of them will mate and then they will start to spread. <coughs> this is a good sign. Uh, symmetrical growth like this means this is one, one uh, strain. Like this, as if I was to put a tiny piece of that mushroom in the middle, this is a clone. Uh, labeling them. Label them with the species, label the date, the generation number is really important. And also the type of media if you do that. I don't do this anymore, but you can. This is antibiotic, <coughs> malt extract, water, just short. We've also found in, in our lab that sometimes since we have, we'll be testing different uh, media or additives. We'll also put the parent plate that's coming from another plate to another generation, put the parent plate on. I actually, yeah, I started labeling mine with alternating letters and numbers. <coughs> so for anybody who picked up the book in there, it's got a different, I, did, I just had to develop a different system. And it really does help because you can tra track back to the actual plates so you're not expanding something with potentially with contamination. I'm in it for, you know, I have a business to run. And if somebody, if somebody reports back that one of their bags has contamination, I can go back and I know exactly where all those are. And yeah, it's quality control. Tracking. So this is a, this is a, now you have a viable living culture on a plate. All right, now you've done it. Um, but do you have spawn yet? This isn't spawn. You can't plant this. All right. Um, there's still a couple more steps. Now this is the viable vegetative state. This is perfect for storing right here. Uh, I don't let it go out to the edge before I put it under refrigeration. If you're going to store this culture, I would uh, parafilm it, which is this it's elastic, kind of waxy-like uh, uh, material. It stretches. I used to use tape. You can use tape if you don't have it. All right? You want to take the lid shut. If you walk with these plates, and, you, uh, and if they're not taped, and you walk somewhere and you push on them, and you flex them, the air go, everything goes in, contamination. So you need to seal that plate. I also use a lot of Ziploc bags in my lab. And you'll be surprised, when they make those Ziploc bags, they are sterile inside. Because they have to, when they heat inject them, they're completely sterile. So for years, uh, in my old lab, I would just, even without parafilm, just drop them into a, a Ziploc bag in front of my laminar, and they're perfectly good, right? So you can do that for a while. Seal them up. Now, this one patri plate can make thousands of, of new plates. So this is your generation zero. So you don't bother to tear them up unless you're going to store them. Or That's pretty much it. So when I'm doing clones in isolation, I'm not in this particular. When I start getting up, when I'm purifying, then I'll start doing it. But if I'm doing a bunch of cultures that I know maybe there could be some potential contamination, I don't bother. So I'll do five plates of one isolated, and then there'll be maybe some residual contamination. I'll just pull, pull the good one out, zip up the bad one, and get them out. The good one stays in the lab. I'm serious, the ziplock bag is easy. Um, so, yeah, so this one, you can go a couple different directions. You want to go plate to plate. You really don't need that many plates. You're at the state where you need to go to grain after maybe generation two. Um, P, see it says P0, so this is a uh, one. So this is the second transfer from a clone. P0, the plate before this, probably had you know some zones on it, basic contamination. I transferred that plate to this plate, it becomes P1. I could take pieces of this and transfer it on a new plate. What is that? P3. Alright. When you start getting farther and farther away from the zero. DNA divides, and it tries to proofread everything, and it doesn't get it right all the time, and it makes has mutations. So the farther it gets away from the parent, the more genetic variability you're going to get, and you're going to get defects, you're going to get a loss in yield, you're going to get a mushroom that might not even fruit at all, and I'm going to talk about that with the morels. So these are your hard drives, these are your flash drives here. Right? Take really good care of those zeros and ones. 
So once you have a fully colonized plate like this, um, does anybody do culture? Do you know what this fungus is just by looking at it? See how fluffy this one is? That's fluffy oyster mushroom mycelium. That's its characteristic. This one is smooth. This one's greasy. Ganoderma. You, when, you, when you know, when you really get to know your mushrooms, you can just look at the mycelium and you'll know exactly what it is. If you see smooth mycelium and you think you're growing oyster mushrooms, you might have mislabeled a plate. Yeah, wrong one. This one also is, uh, you can barely cut it with a scalpel. It's like rubber. So once it's, once it's colonized, then you need to make a grain transfer. This is standard. So how many of you have made grain before? It's not that difficult, right? Do you have any issues? No. You have the moisture content. That's it. Okay. Moisture content is the critical key because bacteria love this stuff. They love grain. Your auger might have some antibiotics <coughs> in it, and I'll show you how to make some of that. But once you go to grain, uh, if it's too wet, forget it. So you need to stay below 60% moisture on your grain. Some books will tell you to mix dry grain with X amount of water and you cook it. I don't do that because it's so the bottom grain is wet, sometimes the top grain is dry. Have you ever done that? So I, now I pre-cook and soak all of my grain so it's uniform and then I drain it. So this is what I do is I soak my rye berries or, or wheat in hot water, not boiling. I just drop it in there and I let it sit for like 20 something minutes. It rehydrates and it swells. This is the moment where you have to drain it and cool it off really quickly. Right. It's just like cooking rice or something. You really got to cool, cool it off quick. So I dump this into a bin and I wash it. It's got holes in it and I rinse it. It also rinses away uh, all the extra bacteria that might have been on there. Right? Spores that are germinating. So I rinse it really, really well. And then I transfer high grain to my walk-in cooler, or you can leave it out and stir it because you want it to dry a little bit. You need it to air dry. All right. um, inside this water, I'm going to back up. I actually add a little bit of lime, garden lime. And then at this state, once it's a little bit dry, I add a little bit of gypsum to it and mix it up. Some mushrooms love calcium. Morels love calcium. But what you're going to do is it helps with particle separation. It keeps it from growing anaerobic right where the grains are meeting. Um, and all that good stuff. But it needs to be dry. Don't ever, you would never load this right into a bag and cook it. You, it will turn to bacteria in, in 24 hours. I think that bad. One hour. How long do you boil it? Uh, about 20 minutes. And I'm not boiling it. I'm bringing it up to about 150, 160. And if you boil grain, it builds up so much pressure they rupture and explode. And then when you transfer that to a jar, it turns gummy and you can't get it out. So, yeah, you, the mycelium will colonize it and then you'll be banging that thing, you know, trying to get the mycelium out of there to break up and you'll end up cutting yourself, you know, cracking the jar. So, Keep the drier the grain, the butter. But if it's too dry, the mycelium isn't going to run. Between like rye berries and rye and preserved seeds, it's not the same thing. Not rye grass. Right. Well, like, can you, you prefer berries? What's up, Brad? Like, uh -huh. the berries rather than the seeds. I guess I just learned the seeds first, and also I just got this berry. And huh. I, I've just been using grain all my life, so I've been using the berries. No reason to. Um, some some mushrooms like the morels prefer a seedier, smaller seed. I've had a lot of luck with uh, mixing uh, Milo and grass seed, just like Milo's, a few grass Milo's seed. really good, actually. It's really expensive where I'm at, so I use what I'm available to. Wheat feed wheat is cheap where I'm at, and we use so much grain I, I can't afford not to use it. Um, then just load them up into jars, so you find some mason jars. Get used to the, having a lot of these on hand. So that's only been cooked for 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Less than 20 minutes. Just soaking in hot water. So you just, I just wanted to rehydrate a little bit. All right. Um, and what I what I generally do is when I'm cooking it, um, 
I, I grab a few of them and I bite them and I, I look at and I check them in half. And I really do, I still do this. I bite them and I look at it and I, it just needs to be a little bit dry on the inside. It'll be powdery dry. If it's, if it's like juicy wet, you screw it up. Dump it. Dump it. Feed it. I feed it to my chickens. They're so happy. Pretty much the grain is all done. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you want? Huh? Um, then you load it into jars. Definitely get one of these cheap things. You know, it's easy. Another reason, not only is it quick and easy, if you're just dumping grain all over these jars, you're getting grain juice on the jars, right on their edge. So when you put your lid on here, um, and these are sitting out, molds are going to be attracted to that juice. Boy, I tell you. This is the entry point. That's a nightmare. Keep the keep the entry points to all your your pastry plates and your jars. That has to be clean. I'll actually go back when I'm culturing and I'll wipe out and I'll clean them off really good. Then put them on, even before a transfer. If you don't like jars, then you can use these bags of grain. This is um, uh, autoclavable bags, right? Um, these are available through Unicorn. You have to buy a lot if you buy the Unicorn. That case. Uh, they're not exactly cheap. If you buy them in the case, you get a discount. These are micro filter patch bags. You can these, this is an autoclavable plastic, so you can pressure cook this stuff. Okay? You don't need a big expensive autoclave, just get a, a pressure cooker that fits, I think a nineteen forty one fit six bags, fairly easy. Now, now that you've cooked your grain in the pressure cooker. Whether it's in a jar or a bag, you place it in front of your laminar. You let it cool down. It could take a couple hours. It's got to be cool. I again use my little thermometer probe and I didn't even add it. The wind goes at room temperature. Now it's time to go from auger to grain. I just chunk it up like this. This is a, I don't want to call it a dry transfer, but this is just a cube transfer to go from cubes to grain. Um, the smaller the cubes, the better, because you can get more inoculum, points of inoculum in there. So then I just drop it. This is looking down inside one of my jars. All right. I drop these little auger cubes in here, and after one day, this is now fuzzing up. You see how beautiful and fuzzy they are? They're happy in there because it's humid, there's grain, there's food right there, and immediately there's going to be a little bit of a lag because they're eating auger. They're eating nutrient auger. So anytime they switch a food source, there's going to be just a little bit of a lag. They've got to you know, taste it, get used to it, and they have to zap their enzymes, then go after it. All right, they just don't jump right on. But the auger cubes will fuzz up really thick and heavy first, and then they'll say, that grain is right there, I'm going to go get it. All right? Then the jars fill with mycelium. These lids that I have have little micron filter discs inside of them. You can also drill a hole and put in a wad of polyester, right? These are autoclavable lids. These are not the lids you buy from the from the from the uh, store. Those melt. So these are special lids. I I use those uh, the ball jar plastic lids. I use them in my pressure cooker all the time. They, they don't, don't melt. melt. No, they don't work. They do. Yeah. Um, How many jars do you do per plate? Oh my God. Um, how many jars per plate? It just depends on how many cubes because, um, I mean, this one plate will do maybe five jars. It's fair. I like to put a lot of cubes in there. I do a lot of cubes. Okay. And what I'll do is I'll do it really small cubes and I'll actually just hold it at an angle over the jar and just take the scalpel and rake it and they, they drop right in. I'm not, I don't do the one, <laughs> two, three, no way. They didn't blink, they just come flying off. Sure, you might lose one on the laminar. Let's sweep that up later. Yeah. The worst thing is um, all right, I'll give you another another hint too, and I'll, maybe some of you agree with me. The books most of the books say you put your cubes in fresh, right? You put your cubes in fresh. What does the book say to do then? Shake, shake it. What happens when you shake it? They stick to the glass. They stick to the glass all over the place all up on top, uh, high where there's no grain. So I just let them sit there, recover, fuzz up. They stick to a couple of different pieces of grain, and then I roll it two days later. 
much happier. Another good trick with that is making sure you don't pour your plates to thin. You're only getting like 10 or 15 mils of auger into the plate. The auger is too thin. You can't get them off. Then, then what I'll do is I'll like put my jars on the sides to get the grain to cover and touch the other cubes. Desperation. So now that you have these jars, now you, can, you don't have to go back to auger <coughs> for a while. Now you've got these grain masters. Each one of these grain masters can make a lot more. So if you get to this stage, you know, you've got the champagne bottle, you know, twist it off, the foil is off. Right? You can't open it yet. So now um, you can go grain to grain. You can cook more grain jars, shake up the mycelium, and then go from grain to grain. That works fine. Um, but in a, a more professional lab, you can make liquid grain spawn, is what I do a lot of. I'll take that grain, it has to be, it has to be pure. No signs of contamination in those jars. No greasy looking spots. It has to be all beautiful mycelium. Um, I use a sterilized blender, right? If you don't have a blender, you can use a uh, another jar with an oster type uh, base. You can buy the blender attachments okay. by themselves, okay. and they actually fit on a mason jar. Regular oster blender fits. Oster blender, yeah. On the ball jars. On the ball jars with the narrow, okay? So I bought my first. Lab Do you know how much laboratory blenders cost? They're really expensive. They're like $800. My stainless steel one is $400 just for the piece. My little tiny one I use for augers, $300. And then I, I started going to uh, Goodwills and thrift stores and finding old glass Oster blenders with the metal bases on them for $2 a piece. <laughs> now I've got a nice collection of thrift store blenders and uh, somebody interviewed me on the radio the other day and he said, so if I walk into a, your, your lab, am I going to see those blenders that you wrote about in your book? I said, absolutely. You know, why? Why spend so that much money for a blender? Um, you put a little bit of that grain in your blender. Um, I use, I sterilize water in a jar or a flask and add some antibiotics to it and I let it cool down. I seal it again and I keep it in my fridge. I always have sterile water for a lot of different reasons, but this is one of them. So I have sterile, sterilized cold water. Cold because when you blend it creates heat. So I cold chill it. So add a little bit of your grain, add enough water just to cover it, and then blend it. Not too long because you don't want to really damage a lot of the cells. You'll make like this little slurpy looking thing. Smells great. Mushroom smoothie. Transfer, uh, blend it, then you can transfer it to more grain, like the big bags of grain. Works really good, and it's really fast. All that liquid in there, of colonized grain, it's going to colonize that really fast. You do not want, the reason I say just cover it with a little bit of water is because you don't want it to be really soupy and watery. Remember what I told you about the bacteria going to grain? Really bad. So you want it kind of thick, like, like horrible thick. And you don't need very much of that next transfer, just a little bit. <laughs> transfer it to more grain or save it in centrifuge tubes. For years I was uh, saving it in these big uh, syringes and things like that. The centrifuge tubes are awesome. I buy them sterile in big packs. Uh, I think $100 for 500 of these things. Right? And I, now I, I use it for everything. Right. Look at there, see there's the jar with the uh, little blender attachment on it. You can buy them online. And uh, you have a tiny little blender, just like that. Guess what? You can blend inside this thing, leave the lid on, and store it. Store it whenever you need it. Because the lids are really cheap. Those little blender attachments are really cheap. And then this is what I pour them into and I store them. So you can see that I've got my Morels, my uh, shiitake wide range. And I'll, I'll make a lot of this stuff so I never have to go back and do the plates and do the grain and do all this. You know, um, if I want to save time, this is the way to do it. Then all I have to do is pull out, I make multiples of these tubes, I number them. Then I just have to go inside my fridge, grab one of these shiitake wide range, 
and each one of these tubes can make two huge bags of grain. How long will they store? Uh, these will store for, uh, that's coming up actually. I think it's three to four months. Now, every now and then, before I transfer, I do a strength test. This is very common um, in microbiology, but that grain, I'll test it, and I'll see how long it can stay in there, right? So when you streak it, you streak it on the plates that do not have antibiotics on it. You want bacteria to show up. You want to see if that's pure. So fresh plates, no antibiotics. You take a little bit of that out and you'll streak it just like that. Yeah. Has anybody ever streaked before? Yeah. Yeah. All right. This is this is not an accident. I put this slide up again. All right, so then you go back to grain with that little tube or that liquid again. I mean, you can just keep going. And any one of those, you can make more grain. But as you expand these, remember, um, the further you get away from that parent plate, the more problems it might have. Fruiting and the more bacteria it is recruiting. You may not see it, but it's there. It's not a perfect environment, right? Uh, also, now, now you have your bags of grain spawn. So from your grain spawn, you can go up another level. Grain spawn can uh, be stored or it can be used. You can use grain spawn for oyster mushrooms right in the straw. All right, we're doing that tomorrow. Or um, you can use that grain spawn and expand it up to sawdust spawn. So this is what you would use to plant shiitake, uh, oyster mushrooms, any of the wood-loving mushrooms. So this is another state. Um, I soak my sawdust overnight. Does anybody else make sawdust going? You do? I have these really huge tubs with valves, and I load up my sawdust, and I soak them overnight. Then I drain them first thing in the morning. I drain it out. I give them 30 minutes to drain, and then I scoop it back, and I mix with my supplements. Then I autoclave it. All right. I was having way too many problems with just trying to add water and get the moisture right. It's just like my brain. I like to let it hydrate. I like it perfect. Uh, it's maximum holding capacity of water, which is great. Uh, and the mushrooms love it. They'll, they'll speed right through it. So that's King Stripharia spawn here. Then once that grain gets dropped in there in front of your laminar, you'll cook this again. I cook it autoclaved uh, in a pressure cooker for about two hours. Then it'll go into the lab in front of the laminar, cool off, and then your grain goes in. So you're just going from patriot to grain to sawdust or chips. Uh, creating your own antibiotics. This was something new, and I did put it in the book. And I'll talk about this in detail on Monday um, on, on the call. But uh, I was having a problem not only paying for it, but antibiotics are pretty expensive to put in auger media. And even the, pre, uh, the, the autoclavable auger is really expensive. But you can make your own additives if you, uh, if you know how to do it. Um, so this is a trick that I've released. Uh, once you get a colonized sawdust block of a mushroom, let's say shiitake or any mushroom that you're growing, then you will make a well that's on the top. You just push it. You're not opening this bag. You're just folding it. It's still sterile inside, and you're just making a little depression right, on the top. You'll let that heal. In about two days, it'll heal. Then you're going to add a fluid, excuse me, you're going to add a fluid in here of your contaminant, basically. Um, it could be killed contaminant. The mycelium recognizes it, and then it's going to produce all of this fluid inside the bag. So it's just created its own natural antibiotics just for you. Free. You'll take a syringe, you'll pop it in there, you'll alcohol that, pop it in, draw it out like that. See, this is foamy, this is Iceman with a E. coli trigger. And I've got all that fluid. Now what do I do with that? I filter syringe and put it back into my auger. Right? When it cools down. Remember I was telling you that 108, 110 degrees as your auger is cooling down? That's when you can add your, your antibiotic back into it. So you can create your own natural antibiotics for your media that's specific to your contaminant. Is that how they do it for the antibiotics and get them the doctor or something? No. No? So it's not safe for me or something? Not at all. Okay. Just, just Don't do it. Don't do it. Yeah. 
Human trials work. You should try it on a mouse first, maybe. Uh, storing your cultures, we were into that. Uh, Patriot plates, up to a year. Test tube slant, that's, I didn't cover that today. It's just gel, it's auger gel in a test tube. Uh, they last longer because it's a lot more auger. There's less surface area, um, less oxygen. Colonized slants or a cubes. All this is, if you cover, if you drop, remember those cubes that are all cubed up like this? Uh, if you drop them into a, a sterilized test tube to sterilize water or mineral oil, they'll last a long time. Uh, that's one of the first ways I started storing them when I was like 22, is cubing them up and putting just loading them in water, cold water that's been sterilized. Then I just reach in with my uh, scalpel and I stab one, you know, like I stab them with pickles or something. Stab one, put it right on a plate, and it comes right back. What you're doing is you're, you're, you're basically suffocating it with the water. Right. And it's staying hydrated, which is good. Liquid spawn, that's, those are the ones in the tubes. I only give them about a year. I use them up so fast anyway, I don't, I don't have them hanging around. You know, if you're making spawn like that, don't use old grain spawn. Uh, this, probably not many people will be doing this, but you can freeze 10 years or more glycerol. If you really have a lot of big lab and you want liquid nitrogen, that's for the big guys, right? Uh, I'm not even there yet, no way. Liquid nitrogen. But what most of us will be up in this this range right here, these top five. <coughs> so start out with patriot blades, but you will know they will dry out, which is okay. Um, but some of, the longer they stay in there, some of them are cold sensitive. They can get damaged by the cold. Storing your spawn, once it gets to a spawn state, all right? Your sawdust spawn, I've actually had really good luck storing it for up to a year. It's viable. I won't sell it. My company won't sell anything they did that's that old, right? That's like buying eggs from the store. Do you know how old the eggs are in the store? Do you want them? <laughs> They're average six months old. Uh. Right? You know the difference between a fresh egg and you ever seen the difference? That's why. Um, they're basically dating them when they leave the refrigerator. Best before date. So eggs never go bad. If it says used before this date, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah. Uh, so, like I said, spawn, uh, it's, it can remain viable. Solid spawn is very resilient. It doesn't matter. But um, the next line is going to be plug spawn. You know? Um, does anybody want to add a plug spawn? Sure. It's easy. It's easy. It's great. Um, again, I soak my dowels overnight. Um, sometimes I'll boil them because they're really hard. I'll boil them in water. And um, some people have molasses, so I just boil them in water and until they sink. When you see them sink, I let them cool off. And then I dump them into a bin and I bag them immediately. Right? Autoclave them in a bag. Then the grain goes right to the dowels inside the bags. And they'll colonize really fast. But the soaking was the key for years. <coughs> Man. Is that good enough? Okay. Uh, plug spawn can last three to six months, sometimes longer. But what happens is if it's, uh, they, they, the woods, the fungus starts to eat the wood, so it starts to soften it. <coughs> you ever hit a, a plug that's soft? It just splats like a grape. It's no good. It's not, it has to be firm and rigid, so you want to make sure that plugs are used fairly quickly. All right. That's why I use a lot of sawdust spawn. It's easier. Grain spawn, very short, like two to three months. You know, it's highly nutritive. Um, it's, high, it's a higher potential for contamination. So use that spawn really fast. That's why I make a lot of my grain, and I use it fast. This it does contaminate quicker than sawdust. We really plug spawn funnel and a dowel, or they, they make a plunger that works. Yeah. All right, I know it's time to stop, but I'm going to keep going. Is that all right? Just yes. quickly uh, cover. Just cut you right to the first slide. Sorry, right, time to get <laughs> Because I'm not covering this at all any for the rest of the weekend. Um, so, um, I mean, I'm dealing with the southeastern morels, so um, this is kind of like what we're focusing on. These tiny little 
We do have ash morels that get about, um, my ash morels get about this big. And I'm not, it's not a fish, you know, ruler. That's exactly how big they get. Um, they good? They're really good, yeah. They're firm, they're big. This is a tulip morel. They're really small. These are the ones I'm having the best luck um, finding because I'm finding, I'm trying to find morels that don't have a, a very strong tree association with so that makes them easier to grow. So I'm trying to find some stuff, morels that are kind of off the beaten path. They just look like something's, I can have never find a true host tree anywhere. So it might tell me that they're more of a saprophyte, not a mycorrhizal association. Okay. Morels associate with trees, but that's a tiny little tulip morel. In my area, ash trees, uh, poplars, my tulip poplar, beautiful yellow flowers. These are the kind of areas, so it, and again, now this is specific to my area, but the technique should, should hold true for um, any climate, except you will need a freeze, right? This is my floodplain areas back behind my house where we make our beds. Um, we're almost like a lot of moisture in our area. Here are some different types. These are black morels, right? These are semi-free or half-free morels. And these are my big blonde morels. Probably they're gorgeous. Um, completely hollow, of course. Big pitch on there. And this is when they get too old, when they turn brown. You're asking, do they taste good or bad? But when they start turning brown, look at all the molds and everything. So these aren't, you know, when they contact each other. But this is a nice, tight um, morel here. Wow, it's a really dark image. Um, so, how do you collect the spores from a morel? Um, I use aluminum foil on, on the tables and I cover them with paper towels. And then, you know, morel is it's a cupped mushroom. They're cups all the way around the head of the fungus. So, you're going to lose some to the paper towel, but that's okay. I cover them because I really want them to dry out. They'll actually hiss out a lot of spores as they dry. So, if you're covering, if you cover them with a plate, like if they say to do it some part it doesn't work. They won't hiss them out. And if they do hiss them out, they're going to hiss out a bunch of juicy, wet spores that are going to contaminate. I drive mine out on the dry screen, so they can pop off the windows. Yeah, you could make some things go out there. Sure. Yeah, you can do that. But this, this works very well. Uh, also, inside of a dehydrator, if it's like below 105 degrees, does anybody ever dry morels on a dehydrator? It covers my dehydrator with cinnamon brown spores. And I'll just take it outside and wash it off in a bucket and then go take my spores out from the wood. Just dump it. Sure. Yeah. So this is a really easy way to, to uh, save the spores. Um, that's just what an ascus looks like um, inside the, the pore tissue. Just a bunch of little spores lined up in a tube. Alright, so this is important. Um, I redrew this from bulk. Um, in, in the book there's a, some it's been essentially the same with some different information added. Um, morels produce spores that germinate. All right, they produce mycelium, but they also produce sclerotia, which are resting structures or tubers. Right? You really have to get to that sclerotia state if you want to succeed in growing them. Uh, sclerotia are actually really easy to grow in the lab. They're very easy. Uh, also. Morels associated with different types of trees. Obviously, this is a amanita, but there's a lot of a lot of things going on here with morels. Morels are predatory on certain uh, gram-negative bacteria. All right, they're predatory during some part of their life cycle, probably before, right after that sclerotia production, those tubers. They're stunning, killing, and feeding on bacteria. Right? That's why it's so difficult to grow morels indoors. How do we know which ones, you know, how do we cultivate that symbiotic relationship? This is a, uh, a plate of a morel culture. Look at all that white, those crystals. They're basically like crystals. Those are all microsclerosia. Those are baby morel tubers all over the plate. All right. They taste like morels. Remember what John was talking about last night with the flavorings? Yeah. He's trying to steal my idea. I have to have a word with John. Yeah, I was making royal bullion cues. 
this is perfectly edible and it tastes just like morels. In fact, I take my scalpel and I scrape them up and I eat them in the lab every now and then. And I get bored. And I just crunch on them and they taste like morels. Uh, this is, they produce these fluorosia only a few, only up to a few transfers away from the wild specimen. After that, nothing. So remember when I said label your plates zero, one, two, three? You gotta stop here at like two. You can't even go three or four. And these are baby sclerosia forming at the edge of the plate. Remember I said when, when they uh, when they reach a barrier, they start uh, producing sclerosia. This is mycelium that's been transferred into the grain. For our mycelium should be fuzzy and brown. If it's not brown, you don't have a morel mycelium at all. Very fuzzy, it looks like fur when it drops in. It's extremely fast. Morel mycelium can grow up to an inch a day. Which is like, uh, if we were morel mycelium, if I was a morel mycelium and I shrunk myself down, that would be like me dividing 22 miles an hour. That's how fast it divides itself. And then to make a morel bed, all right, I don't have the new schematic, it's in the book. If you just want to look at it at the bookstore, look at this picture. Um, it's, a, it's a brand new image. Um, generally, when we're making a, a mushroom bed of King's Trafaria outside, we mix the spawn in, don't we? Generally, does anybody do that? Yeah. Okay. Um, with the morel bed, you divide it into two layers. The bottom layer is nutritive, sawdust, and grains, and your proteins, here. The top layer is non-nutritive. It's sand, peat moss, lime, and gypsum. This whole top layer. You don't have any spawn anywhere close to the nutritive area. Your spawn goes on top, either in the middle or on top. And why is that? Because both figured out that morel mycelium has to form highways. It has to go from a non-nutritive source starve to death, then find a food source, and then translocate, move its food up past its old highways through the old mycelium, that's where it produces the tubers. Here. So it has to form a network, starving, find the food, and then it translocates, backstreams it using the same old mycelium up to the surface, and that's where the sclerosis forms. I was, I was writing when you showed, so you're putting it on top of the sand, heat? Either in the middle in the or middle. on top, but you don't mix it into the nutritive area. Um, the images are in the book because that was the new research for that chapter. If you mix in your spawn, just like you would traditionally, this will never ever form sclerosia. Never. If you put it on top, it'll go down and it'll make sclerosia. Let's say within you know 60 days. If you put it in the middle, it'll make sclerosia immediately. That's what I Sclerosia immediate if you put it in between the two layers. All right, so it'll immediately backstream right up into the surface. So you cut your production time in half. All right. Um, you're starting to produce some of the uh, morels like this. They're very sporadic in little trench beds. Um, these are the blondes. I will tell you that um, going back to this section, when you pick a morel, remember I told you how important like all of these microbes are on the base? So I dig up a few of my morels. I'm, I'm collecting to eat them. <laughs> But I'm also taking a few prime specimens, digging them up and getting a soil sample, along with that colony, the community of organisms that are associated with the fruiting body of that particular one. I cut that off, I label my mushroom that I cloned, or sporulate, you know, A, and I label the sample A. Because I culture them, I grow the mycelium in, in the lab, I get into pure culture, I create sawdust spawn, I make my bed. What do I do with the soil? I put that in a blender, make a big bacterial slurpee. 
dilute it into a five gallon bucket, and that's what I dilute this with. Now it has everybody back together again. Together again. <laughs> right? The next thing that has to happen is a freeze. So, um, morels need a chill hour. They're different in your area, but I'm telling you, the ones that I collect, I organize them into low chill hour and high chill hour morels. So, on mild winters, I'm collecting low chill hours to take 200 hours below freezing to below 32 degrees Fahrenheit, 200 hours or more are going to be needed. So, consistently. Are you going to be growing morels in South Florida, South Beach? Nope. Mid Georgia? You're on the line. Yeah. You may fruit in some years and others not. So know what you gotta have those chill hours. Either that or buy a really big ice machine. Um, that's why locating uh, morels do need a flood. So I would generally when I see a freeze coming, I would flood this with that bacterial slurry and then let it freeze, let it crystallize. And that seems to help. Yeah. Um, about the slurry, any stem bug in there along the soil? Um, do you try to get some high feed or is it just the soil? Just, um, just not the soil. It doesn't matter. You can do the whole stem bug. It doesn't matter. Because at that point, the sclerosis have already formed. And um, this same method, I've conferred with uh, another gentleman. And I write about the story because I thought it was cool. That I was doing all this in the, in the lab. And we started doing it. And this guy out in Illinois, in the middle of nowhere, this, this older gentleman, uh, called me and said, you know, I've been growing morels for years. A long time. And I said, really? I said, how are you doing it? And he told me exactly, he goes, well, I make a trench. He goes, I make a 40-foot trench out in the woods. I put, you know, I put sawdust and stuff in the trench, and then I cover it with dirt. And then I freeze the morels in the freezer, the old ones, and I just pour it out there in the spring. He goes, the following spring, he goes, the, but he said, by fall, he goes, I could move some of this material away. And he goes, and it's just like cinnamon sclerotia all down his row. Right? He told me that the University of Illinois showed up, and he said it looked like morels growing like in a row of corn. Can I guarantee it? No. But um, there has been some advancements, so I think it's I think it's a really good chance of growing them outdoors. Right? Indoors it'll be more difficult. Now that morel bed, is that like a raised bed or do you do the trench? I do the trench, yeah. In the book it's right. That's what I say go look at it. Okay. I'd love to then bruise the morel chapter because there's there's good information in there. There's a whole chapter in there on uh, huge section on advanced like lab techniques, mm -hmm. uh, casing soils, um, how to induce fruiting of mushrooms that need symbiotic partners. That's all in there. It's, uh, <coughs> but it, it can really expand what you're doing. If you want to grow mushrooms that you thought never could be grown, that's the, that's the section for you. Now, and they're the, easy. Does anybody can do it. You yeah. do those out in the woods kind of area. Yeah. So you're, you're doing it in a shaded area. I do it in a shaded um, area that's very similar to the natural habit, habitat. Okay. Yeah. And like I said, every single one. And local strains is what you want to use. Right. Don't buy morel swan for me. Please. I won't send it. Because I know it won't work. Locate your, your native ones. Now there is a trick to get uh, really quick, even without a lab or anything. You take a morel, um, even if it's dry, you know the dry morels that they're selling in the fall? If you take one of them, and I'm actually tempted to do this because I know it works. You can take a dry morel from your area, uh, put it inside a uh, mason jar of distilled water, and just dip the cap a couple times, and then seal the jar back up and put it inside the fridge and leave it there for three to four weeks. And then in three to four weeks, you'll notice that the fluid, all the water will turn um, brown and it'll be floating with mycelium. And then on the very top, you'll see a kabuka-like scoby on top. So you've got the morels, and you've got all these potential symbionts floating around that jar. You put that into a blender, blast it, and then you've got 
an occupant. That should have been on the Sherman off the grid section. Uh, so that, I'm going to stop, but I want to just remind people that there are laminar flow hoods in, if there is one, in the mall. Um, you should not, if you've never cultured before, you've got to do it before you leave. You've got to do it. I had Fox News at my farm two weeks ago, and I had this anchor. You know, she's blonde, high heels, she comes walking in, and I sat her down, and I said, you ain't leaving here until you culture a mushroom. And she was like, I, I can't do it. I said, you can do it. And she streaked the plate, and when she streaked it, um, I said, you just planted potentially a million pounds of mushrooms, right? Every little fra fragment, anything you find on the, the table that you want to culture and take home with you, that's what it's here for. Um, I was here in 1996, and I did not do it, and I regret it. I would have I would have known that much more, but definitely do it. It's easy. Does everybody feel confident? You're, you're actually shaking yes. That's good. <laughs> or you're thoroughly confused. Is anybody thoroughly confused? I'm always thoroughly confused. My friend Chris is. He's, he's known me all my life. He thinks I'm a mess. <laughs> Chris, if you, if you want to ask stories about how I grew mushrooms, the real juicy ones, ask that guy back. Yeah, that? That's at 2 o'clock, right? Yeah, okay. And also, straw cultivation is tomorrow at 2 o'clock in Elks Park. Uh, today at 2 o'clock is going to be the scavenger hunt. That's going to be fun, just walking around town and grabbing stuff, growing mushrooms on everything. It's tomorrow at 3 to interview one of those, uh, maybe, you know, in and out, is that it, at home? That's the big, yeah, the home one. I'm going to be talking about a lot of weird, crazy stuff. All right. Thank you. I'm going to hang around.